Hurry up, hurry up, run to the shelter. It's not safe here. Look, something sparked in the dark. What is it? Sharp teeth, tusks, huge horns. And over there, there's a giant shadow. What's going on here? Shh, don't panic. There are animals and birds that lived on our planet hundreds and even millions of years ago lurking somewhere very close to you. You might say, well, that can't be true. They no longer exist. But what if I tell you that they do exist already? Right now, hundreds of scientists in dozens of labs around the world are working to revive animals we've only read about in books. And who knows, maybe no one will soon be surprised by a tutorial on taming a mammoth or an auroch. Today, you will learn what animals we have lost, who is responsible for their extinction, and most importantly, what we have already managed to revive and why we need it. Extinct animals that may come back from the dead. Dear viewers, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Then there will be more interesting content in your life. Welcome to Australia, home to emus, kangaroos, and koalas. A long time ago, it was also home to thylacines, or Tasmanian tigers. But about 3,600 to 3,200 years ago, these marsupial mammals were no longer to be found, neither in mainland Australia nor in New Guinea. There is a version that they were exterminated in these areas by dingoes, so the only refuge for Tasmanian tigers became the island of Tasmania. But the animals had a sad fate there as well. Who pursued the predators and finally exterminated them? And why did mankind want to resurrect the thylacines? Let's start with its unusual appearance. The thylacine had a body like that of a wolf, a head like that of a fox, stripes on its body like a tiger, and a pouch on its belly like a kangaroo. It had a long, thin tail that helped it keep its balance and move quickly and silently. Its powerful hind legs enabled it to jump long distances and hunt its prey. Usually, it was small mammals and birds. According to other sources, lizards, frogs, and even fish. But people regarded the Tasmanian tiger as an exterminator of livestock and poultry and organized a real hunt for it. The government of Tasmania also declared war on the predator. So from 1888 to 1909, they paid one pound sterling for the hide of an adult and 10 shillings for a cub of the predator. A plague-like disease, competition for food with dingo dogs and the reclamation of Tasmanian lands by colonists all led to the fact that by the late 1920s, there were virtually no thylacines left in the world. In 1936, the last known thylacine died at Hobart Zoo. So Tasmania lost its main predator. Farmers may have breathed a sigh of relief, but nature didn't like it. Thylacines ate sick animals, and kept diseases from spreading through populations. They also hunted smaller marsupials, such as wallabies and Tasmanian pedemolons, and thus regulated their numbers. Without this predator in Tasmania, rodents and birds increased in number and vegetation decreased. In recent decades, Australia has suffered from devastating droughts and fires. Some scientists believe that the process can be slowed down or even stopped if the marsupial wolf is returned to Tasmania's ecosystem. This bold project has already been undertaken by Colossal Biosciences in collaboration with the University of Melbourne and the Tiger Research Center. There is already a coherent plan to recover the thylacine. A perfectly preserved museum tissue sample has been found to recreate the complete thylacine genome. 
A close relative of the Tasmanian tiger, the fat-tailed dunnert has also been identified. Its genome will be used and modified to maximize its similarity to the genome of the extinct animal. In addition to working with the genome, scientists have spent the last few years developing an artificial womb to turn a future embryo into a fetus and an artificial pouch to grow a cub in. Scientists anticipate that the whole process, along with research and preparatory work, will take no more than 10 years. But not all researchers are so optimistic. Part of the scientific community believes that by editing the genome of Dunart, it is not possible to replace all its parts with the genome of thylacine. Therefore, it will be a hybrid in any case. According to some doubtful scientists, it will be imperfect, may have health problems, and when released into the wild, there will be harm instead of benefit to the ecosystem. Only time will reveal who was right and who was wrong. And yet, there is hope. Now, let's move to North America. It's hard to believe, but just a couple of centuries ago, there were countless flocks of passenger pigeons here. The birds were constantly migrating across the continent in search of food and nesting sites. Measuring about 40 centimeters, 15 inches in length, the pigeon could reach speeds of up to 100 kilometers, 62 miles per hour, and was graceful and agile. With three to five billion individuals, it was one of the most widespread birds on the earth in the 18th and early 19th centuries. But by the end of the 19th century, this feathered tribe had rapidly disappeared. No, the extinction of the passenger pigeon is not mystic. Everything is much simpler. The fate of this species was decided by mankind. The point is that there were so many passenger pigeons that people exterminated them on an uncontrolled industrial scale. They were hunted for fun, and then merchants began selling pigeon meat. The price per bird carcass was ridiculous, from 31 to 56 cents per dozen. In the state of Michigan alone, about one billion of these birds were exterminated in 1879. In addition, people were actively cutting down forests, destroying the habitat of this species. All this led to the fact that by 1900, not a single passenger pigeon remained in the wild. The last individual, named Martha, died in 1914 in the Cincinnati Zoo, USA. However, some scientists believe that humans alone could not have exterminated billions of birds so quickly. In their opinion, the overly social lifestyle of this bird also contributed to the extinction. While some scientists dispute why exactly passenger pigeons became extinct, others undertake efforts to resurrect them. And it's not a frivolous scientific interest. Researchers have found that these birds were true engineers of the forest ecosystem. They helped spread plant seeds and regulated insect populations. For the modern ecosystem, the return of passenger pigeons would be a great gift. They are the most important species for the future conservation of forest biodiversity in Eastern America, according to Ben J. Novak, the scientist who decided to bring back the passenger pigeon through genetic engineering. Revive and Restore's project plan is to insert the passenger pigeon's DNA into the genome of the band-tailed pigeon which is the closest species to the extinct bird. And then we have to wait for the embedded gene to manifest itself in the bird after a certain number of generations. And then we could celebrate the birth of Patagionis neoectopistes, the new passenger pigeon of America. But so far, this is a distant possibility. Currently, the scientist is breeding the first birds to receive the Cas9 gene an essential element of the CRISPR genome editing technology. Novak's team needs 22 pairs of birds for breeding. Next, the work of introducing the traits of the passenger pigeon will start. The group of scientists believe that this particular bird has a much better chance of rising from the ashes than any other extinct feathered species. 
museums and collections of taxidermists have preserved many stuffed pigeons, which for sure contain usable DNA. In addition, there are band-tailed pigeons, the closest living relatives of the passenger pigeon, available to scientists. If everything works out, in about 15 to 20 years, we might witness the revival of the passenger pigeon. Australia, North America, now let's head to Africa. On the continent where the hot sun scorches the earth, there once roamed a zebra that differed from the others. It was the quagga, a graceful creature whose name means striped horse in the Hottentot language. Quaggas had a coloring unique among equines. They looked like zebras in the front and like horses in the back. These animals used to roam along the Orange River in huge herds. But after the arrival of Europeans in South Africa, quagga numbers began to decline rapidly. People mercilessly killed the wild animals for their hides and meat. All this led to the quagga becoming extinct in the wild by 1878. And the last individual died in the Amsterdam Zoo in 1883. For a long time, scientists attributed quaggas to the horse family. But Reinhold Rau, a naturalist from the South African Museum, managed to convince the entire scientific community that the quagga was a subpopulation of the plains zebra. He sent samples of dried quagga mussel to the University of Berkeley, California for research. In 1984, DNA was extracted from the dried quagga mussel. The quagga was the first extinct animal to have DNA extracted from its body. Analysis of this DNA and further research led to the conclusion that the quagga was a subspecies of zebra, not a horse. Rao had been waiting for this information more than anyone else. And so, in 1987, Project Quagga was born with the goal of returning to the wild an animal that had become extinct 100 years ago. Rao traveled to national parks to pick zebras with colors as close to quagga as possible. 19 zebras with fewer stripes on the back of their bodies were selected for the project. Based on this population, nine animals were bred through selective breeding to become the progenitors of the new quagga. The first foal was born at the end of 1988, and the second generation came into being in 1997. By 2004, there were 11 breeding centers, and new quaggas already numbered 83. Rao's work continued even after his death. In 2017, the number of new quaggas reached 142, and now it's about the fifth or sixth generation of offspring. The newly bred zebra subspecies, despite the external similarities, is different from its historical predecessors and therefore was named Rao Quagga. Project enthusiasts believe that soon they will be able to release a herd of Rao Quaggas into the wild and mankind will not let this species become extinct again. Well, let's move on from zebras to larger animals, the giants that roamed the steppes of Europe, Asia, and North Africa thousands of years ago. These were aurochs, bulky animals with huge horns and thick black-brown fur. These giants reached 180 centimeters, six feet at the withers, and weighed up to one and a half tons. But someday, they disappeared completely. And once again, it was due to human intervention. The horns of aurochs were coveted hunting trophies. People would drink spirits from them, use them as signal horns and decorations. Hunters who got the hide or horns of an auroch were respected. Only the bravest, strongest, and most skillful could take down this huge, ferocious animal. Julius Caesar himself wrote about the aurochs in his book. Their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither men nor wild animals they spot. Unregulated hunting of the aurochs led to the fact that by the 13th century AD, 
they remained in small numbers only in Eastern Europe. By 1400, aurochs could be found only in inaccessible forests in today's Poland, Belarus, and Lithuania. People already realized that there were few aurochs left, so these animals were kept in royal lands and under guard. The last known herd of aurochs settled in Poland's Jaktoroska Forest near Warsaw. Of the 50 individuals, only four remained by 1601. It is believed that the last female auroch died in 1627. But there is a version that the aurochs lived up to the 17th to 18th centuries in Bulgaria. This is confirmed by a find discovered in the center of Sofia on the site of the ancient Serdika fortress. In 2020, remains were found there that could have belonged to aurochs, according to Balkan scientists. The first attempt to recover the aurochs was made in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. The important mission was entrusted to two brothers, Heinz and Lutz Heck. The brothers decided to recreate the extinct animals by reverse breeding. They selected cattle with maximum similarity to the aurochs in shape of horns, color, and behavior, and they merged them into one tribe to produce offspring that resembled the extinct aurochs. The experiments resulted in a new breed of cattle called the heck cattle. These were tall animals with large horns and an aggressive nature. Encouraged by their success, the brothers rushed to spread the new species across the country, from Munich Zoo to the forest on the present-day border between Poland and Russia. However, the project was met with heavy criticism. Many scientists, having studied the bred heck cattle, came to the conclusion that the species had nothing to do with the extinct aurochs. The heck bull was 20 to 30 centimeters, 8 to 12 inches shorter than the aurochs, with shorter legs and a much longer torso. Aurochs had an athletic build, which was not the case with heck cattle. The horns of heck cattle also lacked the shape, length, and diameter of the original. Overall, heck cattle looked more like domestic breeds of cattle, but not like the auroch. But the attempts to bring back the extinct animal did not end there. In 1996, German biologists began crossbreeding heck cattle with southern European breeds of cattle in the hope of surpassing the results of the heck brothers. The resulting hybrid breed became known as Taurus. They were really taller than the heck cattle and had long legs and a slender body. Nowadays, Taurus bulls are bred in Germany Denmark, Hungary, and Latvia. In 2008, a program aimed at recovering aurochs was launched in the Netherlands. It was called Tauros, thus differing by literally one letter from the previous project. Five years later, the Germans launched the Arend project. Today, it has five breeding herds in Germany. Both organizations conduct joint research and sometimes exchange breeding stock. Klaus Krop, an experienced archaeologist and head of the Orange Project, is confident of the project's success. The third generation of bred animals is very similar to its ancestors. The largest of the bulls is over 180 centimeters, 6 feet tall, and weighs almost a ton, over 2,200 pounds. But the most striking thing is the character of the animals. In 2022, a film crew caught an amazing scene on the coast of Croatia. A herd of Toros had been released here just a bit earlier. The bulls stood in a semicircle, protecting the cows, calves, and wild horses hiding behind them from a pack of wolves. A number of researchers claim that this is how ancient aurochs would react to external danger and other animals would take cover from enemies by hiding inside the semicircle. But what about the DNA of the aurochs? Is no one trying to recreate an exact copy of the extinct giant? Well, there are efforts to do so. The Polish Association for the Reproduction of Aurochs is going to use aurochs DNA taken from the bones or teeth of an animal 
and clone aurochs. The hardest part is to get an accurate picture of the aurochs DNA, and then the genetic material will be implanted into a surrogate mom, such as a regular cow. And with a bit of luck, an auroch almost identical to the original may be born. Time will show whether Polish scientists will be able to go through all the stages and present to the world an exact clone of the ancient auroch. Hmm, aren't scientists going to resurrect an animal bigger than the auroch? How about a woolly mammoth? Thousands of years ago, this giant roamed the vast expanse of ice and snow-covered tundra in search of vegetation. The massive body was covered with thick red-brown fur, and long curved tusks like sabers were ready to repel an enemy attack any time. Male mammoths could reach almost 3.5 meters, 11.5 feet in shoulders, and weigh more than eight tons. Imagine, one mammoth weighed as much as a whole school bus. Mammoths lived in the Mammoth Steppe, which stretched from modern-day Spain to Canada and from the Arctic Islands to China. But the mammoth story had a sad ending. More than 10,000 years ago, these giants completely disappeared from our planet. Scientists are still not sure about the reasons for their extinction. Some blame climate change, others attribute it to hunters. Maybe it was a combination of factors that played a fatal role. Today, thousands of years later, mammoths still haunt scientists' minds. Geneticists dream of reviving these giants. And it is not only about scientific interests, but also about an important ecological mission. According to some scientists, Mammoths can help stop global warming, but this would be possible if pastures appeared in the Arctic. Dense vegetation, along with lots of large animals, could slow global warming. But how does it all work? Permafrost is now actively melting in the Arctic. In winter, a thick snow layer covers the soil and prevents it from deep freezing. If grasslands appear here, animals will actively trample the snow in search of food. There will be less snow, which means that the soil under the vegetation will freeze more. In addition, dense vegetation will help absorb greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. The grass is also much lighter than shrubs and deciduous forests. This means that a lighter surface will reflect more solar energy back into space helping to maintain cooler air temperatures. A grassland ecosystem will even help make the soils in the Arctic drier. Currently, the soil here is overwatered, and there are many bogs due to vegetation with low photosynthesis rates. Highly productive grasses will quickly dry out the soils through photosynthesis. And in dry conditions, if there is access to oxygen, organics decompose into carbon dioxide not methane, whose greenhouse effect is 23 times greater. Scientists are now actively working to restore vegetation. Environmentalists Nikita and Sergei Zimov are trying to bring meadows and steppes back to the north of Yucatia in Russia. There, they have created their own mini mammoth steppe, the Pleistocene Park. Once the meadows and grasslands cover the Arctic again, only one small thing will be missing, repopulating them with mammoths. And Colossal Biosciences Company, together with one of its founders, geneticist George Church, can help. The plan is to create a living hybrid of elephant and mammoth, which would resemble its extinct ancestor like two peas in a pod. Today, scientists have already created a set of modified cells known as induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs. DNA from an Asian elephant was used to create them. In the near future, scientists hope that any tissue of the mammoth's body can be created from these cells. For example, a thick fur, a layer of insulating fat, or ears smaller than those of an elephant. Colossal biosciences researchers have already analyzed the genomes of 53 woolly mammoths based on ancient DNA, 
and identify those genes that make the mammoth unique. Next up, the scientists will work on growing the embryo and implanting it in an elephant surrogate mother. The company's laboratories in Dallas, USA are working on creating an artificial uterus for the growing baby woolly mammoths. Colossal Biosciences claims that the first hairy elephant calf in 10,000 years will appear on Earth by 2028. Although a renowned biotechnology company doesn't know when the dodo, a bird that became extinct more than 350 years ago, will reappear, it is already working to bring it back, along with thylacines and mammoths. The story of the dodo is a sad example of human impact on the extinction of an entire species. When it took less than 100 years from the first mention of the unusual bird to its being recognized as extinct. In 1598, Dutch sailors alerted the world about a flightless bird with a strange beak from the island of Mauritius. The dodo was the size of a turkey, had short legs, and a bulging, impressive beak. The bird really couldn't fly, but there were no predators on the Paradise Island, and it had nothing to fear, until the 16th century, when people arrived in Mauritius. Fascinated by the bizarre bird, they began catching it for zoos and museums. Sailors used the exotic dodo meat as food. In addition, the dodos began to suffer from rats, dogs, and cats brought to the island by man. The defenseless feathered creature could resist neither man nor predators. By 1700, the dodo was completely exterminated. And in 2023, Colossal Biosciences first announced plans to bring the dodo back to life. A big step in the process came courtesy of Beth Shapiro, an ancient DNA specialist at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Shapiro and her colleagues were able to reconstruct the entire dodo genome from the remains of a 500-year-old bird from a Danish museum. The next step is to compare the obtained genetic information with the dodo's closest relative, the Nicobar pigeon, to further modify the pigeon cells to those of the extinct bird. Further, there is fine work to make changes in the primary reproductive cells of pigeons, growing the edited egg cell, and finally transferring its genome into an unfertilized egg. The surrogate mother for carrying the dodo will be a domestic hen. If everything works out, the hen will soon lay an egg from which the dodo 2.0 will hatch. It will not be a real dodo, but it will look very similar to its extinct ancestor. Scientists have yet to master the genetic editing of birds, which is still in its infancy compared to the genetic engineering of mammals. But there is a significant upside. It is easier to work with bird genes than with mammals. This means that revived dodos may appear before mammoths and thylacines. Alongside the work of the Colossal Biosciences team, the Mauritius Wildlife Foundation, MWF, is searching for a sustainable habitat for the dodo 2.0. The problem is that Mauritius has changed a lot over the centuries. It now has a lot of sugarcane plantations, buildings, and water reservoirs. Three places are being considered for the settlement of the revived dodos, Black River Gorges National Park, as well as the neighboring reserves of Round Island and Isle aux Ajret. The islands are preferred, as there are no natural predators. If dodos are to be settled on the mainland, invasive species such as rats, wild cats, pigs and dogs, monkeys, mongooses, and crows would need to be controlled or even relocated to keep the valuable birds safe. However, in the case of settlement on the islands, the dodos will be socially isolated because both islands are uninhabited, and the director of the foundation wishes that people could come and see the dodos. In any case, the experience of biologist Arkot Abjanov and paleontologist Bart Anjan Boulard may be useful to the creators of Dodo version 2.0. 
In 2015, these American scientists managed to grow chicken embryos with a reptilian snout instead of the usual bird beak. They aimed to understand the process of transformation of snouts into beaks in reptiles at the molecular level. A little reminder here, birds are known to be descendants of dinosaurs. It was not easy. Scientists analyzed the embryonic development of the beak in chickens and emus, and also studied the snouts of alligators, lizards, and turtles. The researchers concluded that the development from the premaxilla bone of dinosaur snouts occurred in the same way as in reptiles. But then evolution stepped in, and the twin bones lengthened and joined together to form a beak. The research team undertook a daring experiment. They had to turn back time and make the bird's facial bones develop differently at the embryonic level. They found that specific proteins determine whether an embryo develops a reptile's snout or a bird's beak. The only difference is the growth centers in which they will be located. In reptiles, this zone is located on the right and left sides of the snout, and in birds, in the same place but right in the middle. Using sophisticated operations at the molecular level, scientists managed to block the middle zone without affecting the lateral ones. Then, it was necessary to bring the embryo to the late stages of development. The thing is that the head skeleton takes its final shape just a few days before hatching. The results amazed the scientists. On digital models of the skulls of mutant chickens, it is clearly visible that some chickens got skulls that resemble not the present-day birds, but the famous Archaeopteryx, an ancient transformational form between dinosaurs and birds. Even signs of similarity to some dinosaurs were observed. But it is too early to claim the emergence of a mechanism that allows the creation of birds from reptiles and vice versa. We need to explore the genetic mechanism of beak formation more thoroughly. Chicks with an unusual appearance never hatched. This point was not part of the research protocol. It's not that important. The main thing is that science has made one more step towards understanding the processes of evolution. Yet, one question remains. Has no one ever made it to the final stage in the history of attempts to recover extinct animals? After all, in the case of the aurochs, we only got a similar animal through breeding. But what about a complete copy? Is there at least one fortunate case in history when we turned back time and brought an extinct species back to Earth? Yes, there is such an example, and it deserves special attention. We are talking about the Pyrenean Ibex, also known as the Bucardo. During the Middle Ages, they inhabited the highlands of Spain and Portugal in large numbers. The main feature of the Pyrenean Ibexes was their ability to move deftly on steep slopes and steep cliffs. They were agile, graceful animals with massive horns crowning their mighty heads like a crown. But in the 19th and 20th centuries, the number of Pyrenean goats began to decline rapidly. Hunting, poaching, disease, and limited habitat all became fatal to the population. The last Pyrenean goat named Celia roamed the mountain trails alone until she met her death from a fallen tree in 2000. However, the story of the Pyrenean ibex did not end there. Scientists, obsessed with bringing the species back to life, started an ambitious project that involved cloning. A year before her death, Celia was caught in the Ordesa y Monte Perdido National Park in Spain. Her skin samples were collected and frozen. It was not possible to prevent the animal's death, but scientists paved the way for the return of Pyrenean ibexes while Celia was still alive. Project author Jose Fulch from the Agrifood Research and Technology Center in Aragon, Spain, used the frozen skin samples taken from Celia and introduced the DNA of the Bucardo into the domestic goat's eggs. 
deprived of their original genetic material. This yielded cloned embryos, which were then implanted into other subspecies of the Spanish ibex. Of the 208 embryos implanted, only seven survived, and only one was able to make it to full term. In 2003, the first ever clone of an extinct animal was born. The newborn Bucardo lived less than 10 minutes and died of respiratory failure. An autopsy showed that the animal had a lung anomaly and was doomed. Such anomalies are not unusual in cloning. Now, the research team has to improve the technology and make new attempts to clone Celia. Admittedly, not all of the scientific community favors this project. Reproductive biologist William Holt from the Zoological Society of London believes that a few genetic samples of Bucardo cannot be enough to create a viable population. There needs to be genetic diversity. Crossbreeding closely related individuals is fraught with the emergence of unhealthy offspring, which are unlikely to live a long life. There is another serious issue. Only the female Bucardo can be cloned. Cloning a male requires genetic samples from another Pyrenean ibex, and these do not exist. Therefore, it still needs to be determined how the population of the extinct species will be restored in the future. Perhaps Celia clones will be crossbred with males of another species, but then their offspring will no longer be purebred Pyrenean ibex. Or maybe scientists will create technologies to easily remove one X chromosome without damage and add a Y chromosome to get a male instead of a female. Anyway, science doesn't stand still. And there is a chance that in a couple of years, we might actually meet an animal we've all only seen in books before. Can we now take the plunge and spin the wheel of evolution backward?